uh, again, I hope all uh, you and your families are all, all well. You remain healthy and safe. And as always, send in love um, and positive energy. Uh, so uh, a, a few announcements, and we will, we will get into chapter two today. So the first announcement is uh, I sent to all of you my lecture notes for chapter two. I hope you receive them. I uh, hope they help you. Uh, we are officially going to begin chapter two today. We'll probably take today and Tuesday for chapter two, and then we will take the last lecture of the course, which is a week from today, next Thursday, um, to do chapter three. So, so you are officially now assigned uh, all the readings in Rorty. The introduction, chapters one, chapter two, and chapter three. And by this time next week, at the end of our last lecture, we will have walked very slowly and densely through each of those chapters. So it's so a sign. We're going to get into chapter two today. We'll finish chapter two probably on Tuesday and um, have either the remainder of Tuesday or all of next Thursday to do chapter three. Okay. And at that point, you should have everything you need to really prepare yourself to write uh, the final. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to you the lecture notes for chapter three. I will try over the weekend, um, but if I can, I can't. Um, so you'll have to just kind of read it and come to the lecture and struggle with it on your own. Uh, I'll try to do it, but I don't know how the timing's gonna go. So I'm just kind of letting you know that's a possibility. Um, the final is due two weeks from today, okay? Um, Thursday, May 14th by 3 p.m. your time, okay? So that's literally two weeks from today, Thursday, May 14th, and, and send it to me by email by 3 p.m. your time, all right? Uh, if you don't have a copy of the final, email me so I can get it to you. And uh, that's about it for the, for the announcements. Does anybody have a question? Professor, what good? time did you say we were supposed to turn it in? By three. Okay. By three. And Professor, you said eight pages, correct? Yeah, don't exceed eight pages. Double space. Thank you. Normal font. Yeah, of course. Of course. Thank you for asking everybody. All right. Still we get started? Okay. It's good to see all of you. So let me provide a little segue into chapter two and then we'll begin it and we're gonna we're gonna proceed the way we have been moving through chapter one we're gonna go at a, at a sort of a line by line thought by thought analysis and and kind of extrapolation so so here we go in the previous chapter in chapter one we saw rorty establish the case for a thoroughly contingent account of language the contingency of language showed us that language is simply a tool that we use to describe the world. Language is not, according to Rorty, language is not getting us to the truth or to the real nature or essence of things. Now, in this chapter, as we turn to chapter two, Rorty continues his project of attempting to persuade us to stop thinking of ourselves as metaphysically Reject metaphysical or foundational claims about the truth of the self, about the nature of identity and subjectivity, because he sees metaphysical and foundational accounts of the true self, metaphysical or foundational accounts of subjectivity or identity. He sees those accounts of the self grounded in some sort of objective truth that is itself coordinated its thoughts and actions with a higher moral truth. He sees those conceptions of the truth, the platonic conception of the true self, a theological conception of the true self, even a scientifically motivated conception of the true biologically healthy self. He sees those accounts of the self, of, of, of the true self, of subjectivity, of identity. He sees those accounts as limiting our intellectual and creative freedom. Okay, so, so again, Rorty is a postmodernist. He's deeply influenced by Nietzsche. He's deeply, he's deeply influenced by Derrida and Ber he wants to articulate account of subjectivity, 
an account of personality, an account of identity, some account of what it means to be an I. What story do we tell ourselves about who the hell we are and what informs that story? What does it mean to be an I? And, and Rorty's going to provide a kind of a Nietzschean, Wittgen, contingent account of what it means to be an I. What does it mean to have an identity? What does it mean to be an I from a contingent or a post-modern point of view? And, and again, Rorty's going to try to persuade us into thinking about our identity, what it means to be an I from that point of view, because he believes that metaphysical interpretations of the self, of the I, of the true self, those sorts of experiments are creative and are intellectual. So Rorty is going to invite us, like Nietzsche did previously, Rorty is going to invite us to see ourselves as contingent, as, as sort of beings that are real and, and do powerful and beautiful and erotic and creative things, but, 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 but to see all of those things as a result of a kind of contingency, a kind of construction in particular and specific socio and historical times and spaces. He's going to ask us to see the self as contingent, as, as something that itself is a product of contingent historical and culture forces, but most importantly, in a very Nietzschean way, a project that you and I can take possession of. You and I can take possession of this, of this self that has itself been contingently constructed and, and we can rearrange it, we can restylize it. In fact, to use his language, we can discover new words and new metaphors to describe ourselves. So Nietzsche is, Rorty is going to try to sort of articulate this view of a contingent self and, and why, why taking up the view of ourselves from that point of view is, is actually empowering. It, it, in fact, it, it mobilizes intellectual and creative freedom. It allows us to do things that metaphysical conceptions of self don't. Okay, so following what Rorty says about language, following what he said about language in chapter one, and language's ability to open a place in the world and to give it meaning, right? that's what language does, it opens space in the world and it gives that space meaning, it gives our lives meaning. So following what Rorty says about language and language yeah, place and to give that place, give that space, give that reality meaning and value and purpose, it makes sense that he would see the self as a thoroughly historic, while Rorty, and now, and now I, I want to say something here that gestures to chapter three. We'll, we'll, we'll see some of these dynamics already in this chapter, but he's also already gesturing to chapter three. So while Rorty does see us, Rorty sees us as deeply embedded members of particular historical communities. And for Rorty, our particular historical community is late modern, post-industrial, liberal democracies, right? That when, when Rorty talks about being embedded or being constructed or finding ourselves continuously in a historical community, what, what he means by that, and what he means by that for us, is that our historically contingent society, the one we are born into, the one we are opened in, the one we function in and through, our historically contingent community is late modern, post-industrial, liberal democracies of the, of the 21st century, of the early 21st centuries, right? And so while Rorty sees us as deeply embedded members of a particular historical community, for us, democracy, he also, in this very Nietzschean way, he also seems to think, and this is the key to all of chapter two, he also seems to think that what is most important about us is that we struggle to separate ourselves as individuals from the common language of the community, okay? And, and this is, a, this is the, the kind of the theme of chapter two, um, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a theme that will be related to chapter three. And, and again, it, it, this, this, this sort of treatment of this idea by, by Rorty is a, is a theme that we've seen throughout the class. Right, we saw a version of this in 
and Mel. We saw a version of this in Nietzsche. And now we're seeing Rorty's kind of, uh, kind of take on this, right? While we find ourselves uh, of historical communities, of accidents of time and place, right? It, a core element of, of individuality and certain practices of freedom. And, and this was true for Mill in a certain way. It was certainly true for Nietzsche. And again, it's a true for Rorty. A, a critical element in, in a view of what the self is and a critical element in certain practices of freedom and what those practices of freedom entail is precisely the process, right? That we learn and we find the emotional courage to do, to, to separate ourselves as individuals from the common language of the community. And, and this is gonna be a core theme in chapter two. And, and, and Rorty is going to be a more nuanced postmodern thinker than sort of Nietzsche was in a way, because Rorty's gonna say two things. And by the way, look, as members, contingently born into a particular historical time and space. Us of the, of the early parts of the 21st century, living in, in what is a post-industrial information liberal democracy, right? That's our historical community. We are born into that community. We are raised in that community. That's the social and political space in which we show up as beings, as in which we operate. And Rorty says, look, you know, the, everyone is always already a member of some community. That's true. And, and you got to recognize that and bear witness. But as we also saw in chapter one, everybody also has a kind of private life. We have, we have both private lives and we have both public and community lives. And, and for Rorty, as we develop this idea in chapter two, it, it's going to be a kind of imperative for us in this Nietzschean way to to find the emotional strength and the intellectual creativity to, to separate ourselves as much as we can from the common language that we've been born into. So as Rorty says, while Rorty sees us as deeply embedded members of a particular historical community, he seems to think that what is most important about each of us, what is most important about becoming an I, is that we struggle to separate ourselves as individuals from the common language of the community, okay? While we all inherit a language, while we all inherit a contingent historical community, and thus, while we take up who we are through that language, we should not spend our entire lives simply rehearsing the ideas, the insights, and the meanings that are given to us. While we understand who we are through our involvement with a particular historical community or culture or group, we never establish a sense of individuality if we do not seek to recreate ourselves in and through language. If we don't seek to become what he will call, he'll borrow a, a word from Howard Bloom, and, and, and Bloom gets it from Nietzsche, if we don't seek to become what, are, what in chapter two, in what Rorty is going to valorize, if we don't seek to become strong poets, okay? Um, and this is, this is Rorty's project in chapter two. He wants us to, just, even if it's just for the matter of an argument, to conceive of the self as fully contingent. As, as a kind of accident of historical time and space, but to see ourselves as the kind of people who can take kind of control, who can intervene in that project. And not only intervene in that project, but, but, but by intervening in that project, by engaging in that project, by trying to separate ourselves from the words and the meanings and the values and purposes that we inherit from the community, to become strong poets. And in the process of becoming strong poets, establish little parts of eyes, little uniquenesses, Right, to, to ultimately, as we said in the introduction, to cultivate as dense, meaningful, beautiful, erotic, unique, idiosyncratic, private languages, private vocabularies as we can. That's, that's ultimately what he means by being a strong poet. 
all right um and 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 as he did in chapter one he's going to he's going to talk about that process and as he talks about that process he's going to keep juxtaposing that postmodern notion of self that contingent notion of self with the metaphysical notion of self so he's going to provide this kind of ongoing dialectic and this ongoing debate between these two versions as he moves through chapter two exactly as he did in chapter one all right so that brings us then to chapter two right and home that that rorty uses in the in chapter two to really get this kind of discussion going. Rorty, Rorty um, borrows and uses a, a poem by Philip Larkin to, to set up this kind of debate about the different ways of conceiving the self in a kind of contingent and postmodern way and a metaphysical way. And so to get this conversation underway, Rorty borrows this poem from Philip Larkin and he uses the poem to kind of set the context for this discussion about met metaphysical conceptions of the self, what he calls contingent conceptions of the self. Did I say metaphysical? Postmodern conceptions of the self and metaphysical conceptions of the self. And it, it's a very beautiful rhetorical move because it sets up the discussion beautifully. And so, so Rorty borrows part of the poem. He borrows the last third of this very beautiful poem, by the way. And Larkin writes, Larkin writes, and once you have walked the length of your mind, what you command is as clear as a ladling list. Anything else must not for you be thought to exist. And what's the profit? Only that, in time, we half identify the blind impress all our behavings bear may trace it home, but to confess on the green evening when our death begins, just what it was, is hardly satisfying, since it applied only to one man once, and that man is dying, right? And, and it's a beautiful poem, it's an extraordinary poem, and the way it ends is, is the point of where Rorty wants to begin the discussion. And he reads Larkin's poem. And as Larkin writes this poem, he's remembering, Larkin is remembering all the things that he did in his life, all the poetic, idiosyncratic things he did in his life creative things, all the things that, that made him in, in many ways unique, in many ways special, in many ways made him a poet. This is a poem. Larkin wrote this beautiful poem. And this powerful poet is writing this beautiful poem as the green light of death is nearing. It's extraordinary. It's so fucking beautiful. Right, and here's Larkin thinking back about his life and thinking about being a poet and thinking about all the things he created and, and did and wrote and all the beautiful ways he did. And, 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 and at the first of the part of the poem, Rorty thinks oh, this is beautiful. Here is this poet, here is this creator, here is this person sort of in, in this very powerful language and this very beautiful imagery thinking about all the unique individual, individuating things that he had done. And as his death gets near, he's kind of thinking about that, the ladling list of his mind. What have I done? Who have I been? What have I become? The fuck am I? Right? And, 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 and he gets, and Larkin gets to the end. And then at the end of the poem, as Rorty sees it, right, it, Larkin, Larkin expresses this profound melancholy, this extraordinary sadness and this profound melancholy, Larkin does. Because at the end of the poem, Larkin says, on that green evening when our death begins, just what it was is hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man once and that man is dying, right? And, and, and Larkin, in that last moment, is 
giving expression to a metaphysical longing. And he's giving expression to a metaphysical sadness, right? At the end of the poem, at the end of the day, Larkin was committed to a metaphysical conception of I, of a metaphysical conception of, of, of the meaning and value and purpose of life, right? Because, because he looks back on his life. He looks back on all unique, creative, individual, idiosyncratic, poetic things he's done. And at the end of the day, he looks at all of those things. He's a metaphysician in heart. And he looks at all those things and he says, he says, just what was all of that? What was all of that? Just what it was. That's what that means. What the fuck was all of that? All those poems, all those idiosyncratic moments, all those lovers, all those adventures, all those deep, individualistic, personalized, poetic, creative, artistic. At the end of the day, what the fuck was all of that? This is what Larkin's saying. This is what he's lamenting. On that green evening when our death begins, just what it was, that life is hard. Find Larkin writes, you can feel the heaviness. It's almost heartbreaking. He says, because all that stuff, it was hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man once, and that man is dying. I can almost cry. And so Larkin, Larkin is expressing this extraordinary sadness because at some deep level in Larkin's soul, in Larkin's mind, whoever the man was, he was still committed at some deep and profound level, a level that yearns very deeply, to the belief that there, there was something objectively true about him, that there was something objectively true he was supposed to learn. There was something objectively true that he was supposed to learn about what this man shared with all other people. And at the end of the day, he can't say what that was. And so at the end of the day, he thinks that he has failed. Right. And, and that's what he means. He says, just what was all of that? It's hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man. And now I'm dying. Right. And, 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 and just in a way, Rorty uses this to set up the whole argument. Larkin spent his whole life in this weird way, cultivating this individuality. But at the end of the day, it wasn't enough for him being a strong poet being deeply creative, finding all these private metaphors to, 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 to define and give meaning and value to his life. At the end of the day, it wasn't satisfying to Larkin. Because at the end of the day, all of those things, whatever they were, they were things that only applied to who? To him. And so from the metaphysical point of view, who cares? He thought through through his thinking, through his mind, maybe even through his poetry, that this should have helped him discover not just who he truly was, but, but what he shared with everybody else, right? And, and as we were talking about at the beginning, when, when we were talking, way back when we were talking about the introduction, we were talking about this, this distinction, the fusing the private with the public. We were talking about that at the introduction. And, and Rorty said, look, all metaphysical theories demand of us, they require to us, all metaphysical theories require of us that we discover and celebrate that what we share in a common human nature or a common theological origin, that, what, that, that we discover about what we share. Metaphysics requires that we, one, we find those things and that we celebrate those things as the most important things about our lives. That's what, meta, from Rorty's point of view, that's what metaphysics is. Metaphysics requires that we identify and celebrate what we share as a common human nature or what we share as a common theological origin. And we treat those things as more important than our individuality 
as more important than our uniqueness, right? And in fact, that's quite true. If you think of platonic political philosophy, right? The whole purpose of platonic political philosophy is precisely to discover that you and I are rational creatures. That reason is a unique fact, is a, is a special faculty, unique to human beings, that if we open it and activate it, one, helps us discover true knowledge about ourselves, but also helps us understand true knowledge about justice. And, 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 and it helps us understand true knowledge about the universality of certain elements of human nature. And, and in Platonic political philosophy, that is more important than individuality in a way. That is more important than idiosyncrasy. Same in, same in theology, right? Physical theology requires that we recognize that what we share, a common divine origin, the possession of a soul, and how that leads us to live, Metaphysical theology requires us that we recognize that what we share is more important than who we are individually and who we are idiosyncratically and who we are privately. And you see that lament here in Larkin's poem. Right? Larkin has, has lived this entire life and he's done these perhaps extraordinary things. And he's, and, and, he, and he's writing this poem as the green light of death begins. And he says, oh, on that green evening when our death begins, just what it was is hardly satisfying. He is saying that the, the ladling list of his life was hardly satisfying. It's profound. And you, and you say, well, why? Why, 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 Mr. Larkin, was it hardly satisfying? And he tells you, it was hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man once. And that man is dying. Right? And, 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 and Rorty takes us and he says, look, this is, if, if, if you want to understand the distinction between thinking of the self metaphysically, thinking of the self as objectively true, of this, of, this, of this command that we recognize that what we share is more important than who the fuck we are individually, and that somehow if you don't accomplish the recognition of that sharing, and you don't align your life with that sharing, somehow you're less important, or you have failed, or you are somehow deviant. Rory's saying, if you want to understand the implications of that, he'll get this poem. Larkin is saying, everything that I've done at the end of my life is hardly satisfying because all of those things just applied to who? Me. And I'm just one person. I failed to understand the big truth. I failed to understand the common nature. And I failed to understand the essence of things. And so he says, so just what it was, it was hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man and that man's about to die. And Bloom says, this is, this is the debate, right? This is the debate. And Rorty suggests, he says, well, for Rorty, and, and so, so, so Rourke, let me get Larkin. Larkin is saying, look, I'm about to die. And I'm unsatisfied because I didn't discover the truth or I didn't align myself with the truth. And Rorty is going to argue that's the consequence of metaphysical thinking. And, and Rorty is going to say, rather than thinking about who you are and what you've done and what you've accomplished and what you've created in your life, rather than thinking about it from that point of view, Come to think of the self as, the, in fact, the purpose of life for Rorty. The purpose of life is going to separate yourself from what is common, from a metaphysical description of the self, right? If there's anything to be worried about when one is going to die, Rorty thinks, and this is, he talks about Bloom and being a strong poet, the, the one thing that you should be worried about the most is not that you didn't not that you didn't discover the truth, what you shared with everybody else, 
what should terrify you the most is you, as you are about to die, and, this is, and he's getting this right from Nietzsche, is precisely the fact that as you're dying, you realized that you never became an I, that you never separated yourself from the community. You never separated yourself from the common descriptions and the common metaphors and the common uh, ex values and expectations and purposes. The most terrifying thing for Rorty and for Nietzsche, as one nears death, and we're always nearing death because no one knows when you're going to die, is not the fear that you didn't discover the truth, that you didn't discover what you shared with everybody. The real fear should be that you never separated yourself from others, that, that in fact you never became an I at all. You never, you never wrote something unique. You never did something unique. You never separated yourself from the common language, the common metaphors, and therefore the common accounts of value and purpose and meaning. So on the bottom of 24 and 25, Larkin is arguing on the bottom of 24 and 25, Rorty, this is, Larkin is, the Rorty's language is pretending, but Larkin is pretending, Larkin is arguing that blind impresses those particular contingencies which make up each of us I, that make each of us I, rather than a copy or a replica of somebody else, do not really matter. He is suggesting, this is Rorty's kind of critique of, the, of that moment, he, Larkin, Larkin is suggesting that unless one finds something common to all human beings at all times, not just to one man once, one cannot die satisfied. All right? And, and that's Larkin's lament. That is precisely Larkin's lament. The only things he looks back at his life and the only things that he, he can put on his ladling list, the things that he did, he, he says, well, those were kind of my things. Those were kind of my idiosyncratic things. But at the end of the day, what th those things don't matter because they were just mine and now I'm going to die. And Larkin is expressing that nostalgia for metaphysical meaning, right? Larkin is arguing. that all those individual things don't matter. He is suggesting that unless one finds something common to all human beings at all times, one cannot die satisfied, right? And, and, and Rorty thinks that there's a better way to conceive of one's life and of the poetic and creative and idiosyncratic things people do. And Rorty picks up a very Nietzschean theme, and, and, and he picks up a, a, a term that Howard Bloom uses, and Bloom gets it from Nietzsche, and is a strong poet. And, and Rorty says, look, look the, the, the really terrifying thing about death, Rorty says, as he gets into this argument, the really terrifying thing about death is not the realization at the end of one's life that, that you didn't discover what it is you really terrifying thing at death Rorty argues following Nietzsche is that you discover that you yourself from the common you never separated yourself from the common meanings and the common values and the common purposes in fact the most terrifying thing about death Rorty says is the discovery that you never even had an eye at all. You had spent your whole life defined by the metaphors you inherited, living through their meanings and purposes and values, rehearsing them. And, and in fact, in some way, that means for Rorty, you never had an eye at all. You, at the end of the day, you were just a more or less interesting replica or copy of the parents, of the culture, of the ethnicity, of, of the social economic group, the peer group you're a part of. And so Rorty says the real, the real fear about death 
isn't that you didn't discover what you share with everybody else. The real fear of death should be that as you near death, you realize that your life has been nothing but nothing more, nothing beyond a kind of more or less interesting, less interesting copy or replica of all the words and the metaphors and descriptions and the expectations and the valuations that you inherited. And he talks about this, and, and it, it's really a beautiful turn on this. And so, so the real fear of death, Lord, he says, is the discovery that you weren't an eye at all, that you were, in fact, a replica. You were, in fact, a copy. And, and again, by the way, by the way, we've seen a version of that even in Mill, right? M Mill had his own metaphysical version of that, right? Mill said, hey, look, until you start to separate your, your head, Right? Mill said, hey, look, for most of us in our heads, on our voices, are the voices of our parents, there are the voices of the culture, there are voices of the community, there are voices of the tribe. Right? That, that, was, that was Mill's moment, right? Mill realized the voices in his head were his father's voice, <laughs> right? right? And there's, so there's even a version of this in Mill. And, and even in his kind of metaphysical way, Mill says, look, until you get those voices out of your head, until, until you start thinking and acting as best you can in ways that associate with your own thoughts and your own actions, you're not free. You don't have a real self, a metaphysical self. And as it has Mill, funny, you don't have a history, right? And, and so, so Rorty is talking about the same thing, but he's talking about it in a primarily postmodern kind of point of view. Right. And so, so, so Rorty says, look, the whole purpose of life from a sort of postmodern contingent point of view is precisely to from the inherited language, from the inherited values and meanings and expectations and purposes. Right. And and if there is any anxiety, <laughs> at the end of, of, of right, the anxiety is the discovery you never, in fact, did that. That you you never escaped that influence. You never escaped that meaning. You never escaped rehearsing those roles over and over again. And so he writes. Twenty-four. If one could find distinctive words or forms for one's own distinctiveness, then one would have demonstrated that one was not a copy or a replica. One would have been as strong as any poet has ever been, which means having been as strong as any human being could possibly be. For one would know exactly what it is that will die, and thus know that what one has succeeded in becoming. All right, and so the goal here, the goal is to separate oneself from the inherited metaphors from the metaphysical demand that, that we recognize and live, that what we share and what is in common with its moral expectations, that those things are more important than who we are individually. And Rorty says that's the problem with metaphysics. And it's, it, it, is, it is precisely in demanding that we recognize that what we share and what we have in common that that is somehow more important than who we are as, as creative, idiosyncratic, private people. That, that, that the metaphysics keeps us from being those people. That it keeps us from being potentially and, and almost infinitely intellectually and creatively free.
So Rorty kind of sums this up in 25. And then he, he moves into his argument. He says, I think Larkin's poem owes its interest and its strength to this, to, to this reminder of the debate. The value of Larkin's poems, he, he says, is the way that it reminds us of this great debate. I think Larkin's poem owes its value and its strength to this reminder of the quarrel between poetry and philosophy, the tension between an effort to achieve self-creation by the recognition of contingency, that's what he's calling poetry, that's what he meant by Nietzsche, right? The recognition, this tension between on the one hand, the, 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 the effort to achieve self-creation through the recognition of the contingency of language, and and an effort or an effort to achieve universality through the transcendence of contingency. Right? Do, do, do you acquire, do we acquire a kind of, do we discover a true through the transcendence of contingency because we recognize what we share and who we are? Or is, is sort of the self something we achieve? Is it a, a sort of a, an effect of self-creation in language, contingency of language? And on 26 and 27, Rory goes on and, and he kind of deepens this debate. So in the middle of 26, he writes out this comparison between a metaphysical conception of self and a postmodern conception of self. I can spell it by returning to Larkin's poem. Consider Larkin's suggestion that one might get more satisfaction out of finding that which applies once, but rather to all human beings. That's the demand of metaphysics. That's the satisfaction that we are, we, are, we are told we will receive in and through metaphysical accounts of the self. All right? And so he says, again, just driving this home, I can spell out this difference between different conceptions of self by returning to Larkin's poem consider Larkin's suggestion that one might get more satisfaction in life, meaning in life, purpose in life, one might get more satisfaction or meaning or purpose in life by finding out, right, that which applied to everyone, right, by, by not by just, by finding a blind impress, which applied not only to one man once, but rather to all human beings. All right, and he goes on a few lines down and he says, what metaphysics requires us to think, right? What, what metaphysics explains to us about ourselves. They were going to explain to us metaphysical theories, Rorty's referring to. They were going to explain to us the, lo the ultimate locus of power, the nature of reality, the conditions of the possibility of experience itself. They would thereby inform us, Plato would inform us, inform us, theology would inform us, now metaphysically driven normative social and behavioral sciences inform us. They would thereby inform us what we really are, what we are compelled to be by powers not ourselves. They would exhibit the stamp which has been impressed on all of us. And this impress would not be blind, it would not be contingent, because it would not be a matter of chance. It would be necessary, essential, telic, teleological in Aristotle's language. It would be constitutive of what it is to be human. It would give us a goal, 
the only possible goal, namely the full recognition of that very necessity of the truth of ourselves, of our essence. And again, Rorty is suggesting that that, that, that way of thinking of the self, one, it can't be fulfilled, and two, and, and, and two it limits. It limits the whole purpose of life. It destroys the whole purpose of life. He goes on, talking about metaphysics, top of page 27. Four, four metaphysical theories of the self. What counted as existing, as possible, or as important for us would be what is really possible or important. Having copied this list, right? In metaphysics, the, the, the purpose of my life is copying a list list that's been given to me through the rational discovery of moral truth or or copying this list that has been given to me through divine revelation this is who you are and this is how you live copy the damn list align your mind align your sexuality align your values align your purpose with list the purpose of your life is to become a copy of this list that's what metaphysics demands become a copy of what is 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 written as truth as written or revealed in divine revelation what counted as existing as possible or as important for us would be what truly is having copied this list one could die with satisfaction Faction, having accomplished the only task laid upon humanity, nosce te epsum, to know the truth, to know the self, or to be in touch with what is out there. Those are the demands of metaphysics. And this is why, and this is why, we go back to the poem. This is why Larkin writes, on that green evening when our death begins, just what it was, what was that? I'm looking back at my life. I'm looking at the ladling list of my life. Who the hell was I? What did I do? How did I make love? Who did I marry? What poems did I write? Just what it was, just the what it was, was the life and the details of the life. And Larkin is dying. The green light is there, it's fucking beautiful. And he's looking at his life and he says, what the hell was it? Who was I? What did I do? And he says, it's extraordinary. It's heartbreaking. Just what it was is hardly satisfying. This is him talking about his own life. Just what it was is hardly satisfying. And why? As he writes, it was hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man once. And now I'm dying. I didn't achieve what I was supposed to do. I didn't copy the ladling list of truth. I didn't copy the ladling list of morality. I didn't copy the ladling list of divine revelation. Heartbreaking. And so, Rorty moves. He moves into a contingent notion of self, a postmodern notion of self. And the purpose of life for Nietzsche, the purpose of life for Rorty, the reason of seeing the self as fully contingent is precisely, is precisely to separate yourself from being a copy. And, 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 and discovering as the green light of death nears that your whole life was simply just a copy, a more or less interesting version of the words and the metaphors and the definitions and the meanings and values that were imposed upon you. And so on the first paragraph of, chat, of page 27, Rorty writes, it was Nietzsche, back to Nietzsche. It was Nietzsche who first explicitly suggested, and again, we saw this already in chapter one. It was Nietzsche who first explicitly suggested that we drop the whole idea of knowing the truth. 
his definition of truth as a mobile army of metaphors amounted to saying that the whole idea of representing reality, discovering the truth by means of language, and thus the idea of finding a single context for all human life should be abandoned. Nietzsche, he hoped, Nietzsche hoped that once we realized that Plato's true world was just a fable, we would seek consolation at the moment of death, not in having transcended our uniqueness, but in being that particular sort of dying animal who by describing him or herself in his or her own language had created himself. The goal of life is to be as creative and, and, you, and, and sort of idiosyncratic, private, poetic as one can be. As, and, and, and that whole process is in and of itself pressed into the service of distinguishing yourself exactly from what you share with us. The purpose of life isn't, isn't to discover what you share and ignore and destroy individuality. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. It is to separate yourself from the inherited metaphor, the inherited language, the inherited morality, the inherited sexualities, the inherited expectation, the inherited demands. It's precisely so you don't live your life as a copy of the ladling list, whether it's some sort of theology or platonic expectation or Aristotelian end or scientific hell. The point is to die knowing you described yourself as best you can with the tools and the capacities and the time you had in your own words, in your own metaphors, in your own language, that you became your own strong poet, that you achieved yourself through a kind of self-creation by, by recognizing the contingency and therefore the infinite power of language to describe and re-describe and re-describe who the hell you are and what you want to be and how you want to live. So you have an eye. At the end of the day, you have an eye rather than a, a, a fairly interesting or uninteresting porcelain statue from replica. Don't let your life become a porcelain statue of something else. He hoped that once we realized that Plato's true world, Plato's justice, his moral virtue. Nietzsche hoped that once we realized Plato's truth was just a fable, it was yet another poem, another human invention, another assertion of power in the ongoing endless history of contingent and agonistic combat over what things mean and who they are. He hoped that once we realized that Plato's truth was just a fable, we would seek consolation. We, we, we wouldn't be terrified by that, right? It would, that, that that could be satisfying. That we would seek consolation at the moment of death, not in having transcended our individuality through knowledge of the truth, but by describing ourselves in our own terms. And in describing ourselves in our own terms, we create ourselves. To create one's mind is to create one's own language rather than to let the length of one's mind be set by the language of other human beings. It's beautiful, it's perfect. To create one's mind through an ongoing, aesthetic, poetic, creative, artistic, agonistic, painful, emotionally difficult process to create one's own mind by creating one's own language, by creating one's own definition or stylizing those definitions, 
by having the emotional courage and the openness, the intellectual and poetic openness to do that and to struggle and to experiment and to redescribe and redefine and the whole time bear your own burden of your own responsibility to create your own mind by creating your own language. That's the purpose. Only in and then do you have an I. Only in and then are you an I rather than a porcelain statue. To create one's mind is to create one's own language rather than to let, rather than to let the length of one's mind, the context of one's mind, the content of one's mind be set by language of other human beings. And so bottom of 27 goes on. In Nietzsche's view, the view that Rorty is advocating, achieving this sort of self-knowledge, right, in doing this, in creating our own mind by inventing our own words or stylizing words or speaking in ways that are meaningful to us, that are poetic to us, that are erotic to us, that are dense to us, that are creative to us, to, to create what Nietzsche called in the preface of the genealogy, our own private garden. In achieving this sort of self-knowledge, we are not coming to know a truth which was out there. Rather, the process of coming to know oneself, confronting precisely one's contingency, confronting and bearing witness precisely to the contingency of language to the contingency of one's historical community, to know oneself, the process of coming to know oneself, of confronting one's contingency, tracking one's own cause home, is identical with the process of inventing a new language. That is, of thinking. And by the way, this is happening all the time. This is not some abstract thing that only geniuses are doing. This is happening all the time. is a process of inventing a new language. That is, of thinking up new metaphors for any literal description of one's individuality, which is to say, any use of an inherited language for this purpose will necessarily fail. You have to, you, you have to be prepared to, to, at the very least, begin to stylize language. And, and by the way, that, that sounds rather abstract. What he's talking about is the, the process and the power of redescription, right? And, and, and we all inherit descriptions of who we are and what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to marry and how we're supposed to make love and, and what we're supposed to think. Of course, that's what it means to be constructed in language. It's what it means to find yourself embedded in a historically contingent community. Of course, no one escapes that. But that doesn't have to be where you die. You don't have to die a porcelain statue of those things. Everything, every word, every idea, every meaning, every type of music, it's all potentially open to redescription, to stylization, to redescription, to reimagination for the purposes of the density and the beauty and the eroticism and the idiosyncrasy of your life. And by the way, as we said in, in the introduction, those, word, those words, those metaphors, those descriptions, those stylizations, as long as they don't harm anybody, you're under no justification to explain them to anybody. You're under no justification to tell, to explain, to justify to another human being why you are redescribing your love life or, your, or, or the music you listen to or how you dress. You're under no obligation, no expectation to justify. Those are your metaphors. In his view, in achieving this sort of self-knowledge, we are not coming to know a truth which was already out there or inside of us. Self-knowledge is self-creation. 
the process of coming to know oneself, confronting one's contingency, confronting one's, one's limit, one's death, tracking home one's causes is identical with the process of inventing a new language. That is, of thinking up new metaphors. One will not have traced that idiosyncrasy home, but will merely, if you think of language as, as connecting with some truth, you won't be able to do that because you will be searching for the right words, the correct words, the proper words, the only words that connect you to that moral truth or reveal who you truly are inside. And so Rorty writes, and it's, 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 it's quite dramatic. On the top of 28, he writes, to fail as a poet, and, and this is Rorty's position as well, to fail as a poet, and thus for Nietzsche to fail as a human being, is to accept, is to accept somebody else's description of oneself, to execute a previously prepared program, to write, at worst, elegant variations on a previously written poem. That's it. If you don't separate yourself from the language that you've inherited from, and from its metaphors, from its descriptions, from its values, its purposes, expectations, from the boundedness of how you live, if you don't accept, escape that in some way, one, you don't have an eye. You, you literally don't have an eye. And not only do you not, but it's, it's profound. If, if, if you fail to be poetic in this way, you don't have the emotional courage. If, 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 you're, if you're not, if, if you see language, and, it, and by the way, it's, it's not just this kind of voluntary thing. It's not, it's not, it's not just that you need, I guess, a sort of, a sort of an emotional courage, but, but it's, it's also, it's, it's an intellectual thing, right? If, if you are genuinely philosophical, if you are genuinely metaphysical in your mind and in your soul, if you're genuinely committed to the idea that there's already content in your mind and that you're in search for the correct word that, 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 that sort of describes that content and those things get you into contact with the truth out there, and or reveals a truth in here, and that the purpose of life is to align yourself with that. If that's really how you see your mind and how you see language, then you will literally spend your life either literally copying the ladling list that you have been given, or, or, or you will narrow your search for only words that you're supposed to find, or the words that cohere with the truth or reveal the truth. Right, you, you, as a kind of intellectual construct, you, you're almost kept. And by the way, that's the purpose. Its purpose is to make more people like, like, like the truth. You, 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 you're kind of confined. In it, I, I guess now they call it bandwidth. What's your bandwidth? You have a wide bandwidth. You have a narrow bandwidth. Right, you, you're, you're kept within a narrow bandwidth. Of, possible, of words, what, what words matter? Are you sure you got the right words that matter? Spend the rest of your life looking for those words that matter, and they matter because they connect you to the truth. To fail as a poet, and thus for Nietzsche to fail as a human being, is to accept somebody else's description of you. The ladling list, you copied the ladling list. You copied Plato's ladling list. You copied the Catholic's ladling list. You, you copied the tribe's ladling list. Is to accept somebody else's description of you. To execute your, what, the, what, what your life was at the end of the day. What your life at the end of the day was, was to execute. It was a previously prepared program. You lived the program to write at most elegant variations on a previously written theme, on a previously written poem. You are a porcelain statue. Middle of the page 28. If with Davidson, 
we drop the notion, if we follow Nietzsche, if we follow Davidson, if we follow Wittgenstein, if we see language as a human invention, words as tools that have meaning, that allow us to do things. What are they doing? They're describing things. So we can do what? So we can give a world that doesn't have meaning and value and beauty. And we can make it as creative and, and, and wild and unique and funky and idiosyncratically as humanly possible. If with Davidson, we can drop the notion of language as fitting with the world. We can see the point of Bloom and Nietzsche's claim that the strong maker, the strong poet, the person who uses words as they have never been used before is best able to appreciate his or her own contingency. And, and, and not just best able to appreciate his or her own contingency, celebrates the contingency, leaps into the abyss of the contingency, it becomes empowered by the contingency, becomes liberated by the contingency, becomes unique and an I in the contingency. That's the point. And and, and, and again, I, forgive me for, for, for going back to, to these worn out examples, but one, this is happening from a certain point of view all the time. It's something we celebrate. It, it, and in fact, in fact, we, people who do this, we, we, call them, we, we call them artists. We call them creators. And we're fascinated by the process. And, 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 and this happens in music. It happens in painting. It happens in literature. It happens. People dress themselves in, in, in some very common ways, in some very profound ways. Right? They learn, they learn strong poets or artists or makers are people who use words as they've never been used before. And now and he's, obviously he's talking about language in, in, a, in a particular sense, of course, and we're talking about words, okay, but, but, but it means something bigger, right? It means something bigger. But Picasso, but, but Picasso became fucking Picasso, not because he painted like every other painter for a thousand years before him in the realist tradition. In fact, he did. He was really damn good at it, right? Before, before Picasso becomes Picasso, before Picasso becomes I, before Picasso has an I, rather than just being a talented paper painter in the realist tradition, right? He, he uses paint. He uses canvases in ways that people never used them before. That's what this is getting at. Obviously, Rorty says to, to use words as they have never been used before, that is, that's where it begins. Absolutely, but he's not, Rorty's not just talking about words. He's talking about all modes of poetic, aesthetic, or creative expression. Again, in my, my stupid example, the origins of rap music, the origins of hip hop, were when people used words. Either they invented their own damn words, which is fascinating, powerful, profound, and they invented their own damn words to, to describe their life, to re-describe their life, to describe their life as acts of resistance. Right? It's extraordinary. And they, and they put music to it. They used words, they invented words, they stylized words to re-describe their experiences, to re-describe their life, to, 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 ex to, ex to get out of the common descriptions. Capitalist culture, poverty of race. It was precisely in inventing new words and stylizing words and using words that have never been used before or using them in ways that hadn't been. It is precisely in doing that that they, that they escape the common, inherited, and sometimes oppressive language of race, of poverty, of, of, of all this stuff people 
use, these words they use to sort of define and frame and trap. How do you escape that? You, you literally invent a new reality, first for you, in language. Picasso escaped the, the trappings of realist painting, the boringness and the stupidity and the banality of realist painting for a thousand years. Yeah, you painted, the horse looks like the horse and the forest looks like the horse. Big fucking deal. I've got a thousand paintings sitting on my wall in my chateau of horses that look like horses. Show me something different. Escape that. How do you escape that? You don't escape it by going deeper into what you've been told to do and how you're supposed to do it. You escape it by getting out of that. And how do you get out of that? You invent new ways of speaking. You invent new poems. You invent rap music. You invent cubism, post-cubism. You're James Joyce, you write Ulysses, you, you destroy the entire grammatical structure and the narrative structure of the modern novel. And it changes world history. That's how you escape it. That's how you become unique. And therefore, when you do die, the green light of your death comes, you can look at that and you can say, I escaped. I escaped. I wasn't a porcelain statue gathering dust. Bottom of 28. Oh, class is over. Sorry. <laughs> Too funny. All right. Bravo, Professor. Bravo. See you guys on Tuesday. <laughs> okay, see you then. Tuesday. <laughs>